And uh, the sermon went something like this. Now, God kind of lifts us up and moves us to a new place, but you got to be really careful of who you hang out with because your other friends who don't know Jesus will probably do something like that to you. And that's why you need to hang out with other Christians. All right, thanks. Gosh, you're fantastic. Thank you. (laughs) And so um, it seemed like really, really wise advice, uh, except for the fact that it pretty much talked about how um, we need to just stay away from the world in order to stay holy. Um, I want to give you a contrasting image. Uh, Growing up, my grandfather uh, was a minister, and I wasn't very interested in the faith he had to share with me, and when I went over to his house as a little kid, I kind of just wasn't into the stuff that he had, but he always had these glowing crosses, (laughs) Um, like little, like glow-in-the-dark things, and he would always let me have one, and the very first thing that I did when I got a glow-in-the-dark cross as a little kid is... What? You run out, you find the sun, you power that bad boy up, and then what do you do? You go to the darkest room you can find. You're like in the basement or in a bathroom or somewhere where it's completely dark so that your light can shine. Um, That might be a better image of what it means to walk with the Lord. Um, And we're going to see these two ideas. What does it mean to be a Christian? To keep oneself separate and holy? Or to... Uh, go into the darkness, as it were, um, and the risks of that, and the passage that we're going to look at. So we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 10. Um, I want to warn you, it was a very challenging uh, passage to try to break down for a sermon, because it there's, there's just a lot of words, and we're used to like five or six verses being uh, what we preach on, and, and this one doesn't lend itself to that. So I'm going to read a chunk of scripture here, but I hope that you can jump into the story with me. Um, So, Acts 10, starting in verse 10, it says uh, that Peter became hungry and he wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance and he saw heaven opened up and something like a sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. And it contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles on the earth and birds of the air. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill something and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I, I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time and said, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And this happened three times. And immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. And while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was, and they stopped at the gate. And they called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about this vision that he'd seen, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Don't hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? And the men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. And then Peter invited the men into into his house to be his guests. And the next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. And the following day, he arrived at Caesarea, and Cornelius was expecting them, and so he called together all of his relatives and close friends. And as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence, but Peter made him get up and said, stand up. I'm only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people, and he said to them, you're all well aware that it's against our laws for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? And Cornelius answered, Well, four days ago I was in my house praying at this hour, and at three in the afternoon suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He's a guest in the house of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. And so I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. 
Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything that the Lord has commanded you to tell us. And then Peter began to speak. I know you realize, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. And then I'm going to, he lays out the gospel about Jesus of Nazareth, uh, which I'm going to kind of shoot past here. And then um, he says, well, while Peter was still speaking these words, while he's telling the gospel, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on these Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked Peter to stay with him for a few days. Let's pray. God, thank you for this event in Peter in Cornelius' life. Thank you that you um, bridged a gap that was previously not bridged. Um, you brought people together in a way that that was risky, um, that, that had some lines crossed, and yet your grace um, seemed to cover that. So, Lord, as we look at this passage, as we consider it in our lives, I pray that you would speak to us. Amen. Ah, so, um, let me unpack a little bit about what's going on. Uh, the vision Peter had uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, there was the whole set of food laws that a Jew was told, you know, you can keep your relationship with God clear if you just don't eat these certain things. It's kosher foods, specific things, and... As he got this vision, they were all things that a Jewish man should not eat. And the fear was that if you had these unclean things to eat, that you would become unclean and therefore separated from God. Um, and then how that translated into real life was they had also been told, every Jewish boy knew, you don't hang out with these people over here. They're the unclean people. And any number of things that you might do while you're with them, you might shake their hand, you might... Uh, eat some food with them, and you, these things will make you unclean, and so you have to stay away from them. Um, and so it presented this perspective of Christianity, of, of it very much being an us versus them. If you want a relationship with God, there's us, and then there's them, and the us is stay together, and you stay away from the thems, um, which is, to me, incredibly ironic, because uh, the only way to get into the insider club and be a part of the insider club of the us is to admit that you're totally incapable of being clean and right with God. And so therefore you desperately need God's help in order to do that. And so now all of a sudden you're a part of the insider club. Um, and there are moments in our lives I feel like that we come across in our faith, in our journey, that we go, uh oh, here's somebody that's a them. There's somebody that's across the line from me and is what's going on. Okay. Um, one of my first uh, ministry opportunities when I got to Bible school was to do homeless ministry. I thought that was going to be awesome, so I went down and I met this uh, really, really cool pastor who goes out every Saturday night and he, um, he prays with the homeless and he invites them to a prayer service that he had later that night. And um, I was excited to go for a walk with this guy. And he found a couple guys and asked him how he was doing. He knew all of them by name. And then he asked him if we could pray together. And I was, I was thinking, this is great. And then he starts praying, and he's swearing like a sailor while he prays. And there's this little Bible school student, new to the faith, going, is this okay? <laughs> I asked him that after we got done praying. And as we were walking on further to go see some other people that he knew, I'm like, is that okay? Can you do that? And... Uh, and he said, well, I'm speaking their language. Like, they've had hard lives, they, they get it. Um, and he was inviting them to come to this prayer time that he had later on that night, and we ended up with five or six people. Um, he worked mostly in Pioneer Square with Native American uh, folks that were on the street, and um, and they had sweet grass incense, which, which was traditionally used in, in their faith, um, there at the service. And then so... Um, he lights the sweet grass incense, and, and they're 
waving the incense into their face, and I'm going, this looks tremendously like another religion. And as we're doing this, he's reading scriptures about our prayers rising up before God and God accepting the prayers of the saints. And it was like these two worlds collided. And, and as I was going home with my other friends from the Bible school, we were all trying to figure out, did we just cross the line? God unhappy with us. Um, and over the years, that subject has come up again and again. Um, is it okay for me to go to a poker party at my brother's house? Is it okay to be at happy hours? Um, after work, is it okay to swear? Uh, where is it crucial to say, I'm a Christian, so I don't participate in that? And who is it that I'm actually against? It's a strange thing. We always have to find the who we're against. Um, it happens quite often, and Christians are well known for finding who they're against, and those groups know that Christians are against them. Um, it's, it's part of how we function, and, and this was Cornelius to Peter. It was definitely the them. The them that you don't go to, a threat to his purity, a compromise of his faith. And everything up in Peter's life up to that point uh, said, don't go to Cornelius, except for this vision from God. It was a tremendous response by him to do so. Um, I don't think we get the gravity of him saying, sure, I'll go with you. We just go, oh, that's a nice dream. Who's your others? Do you have an others? Do you have a Cornelius in your life? Someone that you go, man, that is not who I want to spend time with. Uh, I know my first sense of others came in fourth grade. Um, I had moved from California to Seattle, um, and we lived in Bellevue. I was uh, living there with my three brothers and my single mom, and she was a master's in nursing student. Um, and we just didn't have a lot. And in Bellevue, not having very much money was an issue. And fourth graders can be kind of cruel. And I was an easy target. I was tiny. I was the smallest kid in the class, male or female. I was super sensitive. So if you made fun of me, I would usually cry. And, um, and then you add on to that, I didn't have the right clothes to be in Bellevue. And everyone could tell at a moment's notice. Um, and, then, and it got bad. It got, I was kind of bullied. I was bullied to the point where I went to an alternative school in fifth grade because I couldn't be um, at that school anymore. And so for me, um, rich, especially kids, was my other. I did not want that. And when I became a Christian, I said, Lord, I will do anything. You want me to go hang out with the homeless and, and pray and swear with them? I would be glad to do that. You want me to do anything. But just don't send me to rich kids. And, of course, my first two opportunities to do anything in ministry were Sammamish Bible Camp right on the shores of Lake Sammamish <laughs> and a youth group in the plateau of Issaquah. <laughs> so, and I went to these things going, man, I do not like these kids. I don't have anything to offer them. I, um, I'm, I'm a poor college student, and they have everything. The parents have given them everything. I don't know how to relate with them. And what I found out was that a lot of them needed the love of God. And that was something that their parents hadn't always given them. But God had to um, kind of pull teeth to get me to go. Um, it was a hard, hard thing for me to go. Um, I think there's times in our lives where we feel like we want, for our own comfort, or even for a holy reason, to try to maintain our distance from folks, um, keep our standards um, rather than see what God can do. And yet, uh, when those boundaries are crossed, uh, oftentimes God shows up. So who's your Cornelius? Who's your other? Would you be willing to go on a three-hour hike with a outspoken, bold Democrat or Republican, depending on which camp you might find yourself? Um, how do you feel about a dinner with a bunch of atheists and agnostics and <laughs> um, Muslims or whatnot? Uh, what if you got invited to a bachelor or bachelorette party in Vegas that you don't have control over what's going to go on on the agenda? Can you walk out your faith there? Can you hang out with God there? Can you let God do something? Um, it's a funny thing how we get these Corneliuses. They come up in all sorts of ways. Mine, uh, 
experience something bad from the them, therefore there's there's a resistance. Um, maybe it's just something that was talked about in the house. I, I didn't even know it, uh, but I grew up in a house that my dad highly valued education, and so he had a tendency to talk down about anybody who didn't have an extra degree. Blue collarism. I didn't even know it was an ism that I grew <laughs> up in. And you were somehow less if you hadn't gone to college. Um, beware the blue collars that drag you down, just like that old youth group lesson that I used to give. I'm sorry, Lord, I shouldn't have given that. Um, sometimes I think we have Cornelius just because we need a scapegoat. We want something to blame um, our problems, the world's problems on. And it certainly isn't us, so it must be them when we pick at them. Sometimes I think it might even be our own selves. We look around and, and we see something in us and we go, man, I don't like that about myself. I, how can that be lovable to God? And then when we see it out in somebody else, we react really, really strongly. I remember hearing this, this one particular minister who, who spoke um, quite angrily, uh, violently about um, how much God hates homosexuals. And... Um, and about how men needed to be extra masculine. And I remember uh, I asked a counselor friend of mine what, what he thought of his, his preaching, and, and he said, is he either really insecure or gay? <laughs> totally caught me by surprise. And I don't know how much credence to give to what he had to say, but there is something about that. When we see something in ourselves that we haven't let the grace of God into, and then we see it in somebody else, we want to rail against it. We can be our own Cornelius. But the question is, um, are we open to actually sharing our lives with the other, to the them? But they're actually not even being a them, but it just being in us who needs the Lord. What happened? What would happen in our church if, uh, if a gay couple started going here? Um, I'm not trying to talk my mom into going to church forever. It's scary, though. <laughs> She doesn't know how Christians would react. How would our church do? Um, we have a group here that meets on Wednesdays called Cocaine Anonymous. And um, I went and let him in and kind of did the orientation for him and told him, here's kind of our expectations and here's where you can find things you need and here's how to get a hold of me if you if you need anything uh, done and, and to kind of just have a face-to-face -face meeting. And, and these people look rough. I mean, we are talking... Uh, a lot of tattoos. They were a little bit, little scary individuals. Um, they're probably not who seems to be here at this particular service. I don't see anyone that I can connect with that group. And yet, I found myself really, really liking these people. And I, and I told them, if you ever have the courage, I just want you to know it would really help out our congregation if you were to come on a Sunday morning. If you did, I would consider you my personal guest. And. Uh, I, I would definitely save a seat for you next time. We didn't know they, they didn't come, but um, what would it be like? Would we welcome them, or would we send off the vibe that you're not welcome here? Um, would we invite them out to lunch with us? Would we take them into our home? How far could the line go? Um, I remember one day in Arizona, I was uh, doing a college ministry internship, and I found a young man sleeping on the sidewalk out in front of our church. And I went and talked to him, and I have no clue if the story he told me is true or not, but he basically said, as a college student, I was moving here, all my stuff got ripped off, no money, nowhere to stay, and so I was sleeping here. And so I said, well, hey, I got a apartment, you can come hang out with me, and came into my house, took a shower, we played video games for a while, and then uh, we were going to get some sleep, and then um, I didn't sleep. <laughs> I was worried. Is this guy going to rip me off? Is he going to take off in the middle of the night with my stuff? I have no clue where all of these presuppositions about this person came from, but it was a risk. I could have got hurt. There could have been loss. Um, in the church, the next day we, we went to church and the church rallied and bought him a bus ticket and uh, he ended up going on his way. But um, I was shocked at how much I saw this guy as a Cornelius. Just a guy. 
No malice, nothing, just a guy. Sometimes it's really, really hard for us to imagine the grace of God reaching out to somebody else. I think we get it up here. But we have issues in our heart that makes it hard. But there's a tremendous cost in our lives, as well as the lives of the other people, if we can't let the love of God in. If we call unclean what God has not called unclean, um, we will miss out on a lot. I heard a story this week as I was um, talking to this pastor friend of mine about a couple in her church who um, their daughter has identified as transgender. She is in the process of wanting to live the rest of her life as a man. And the parents have absolutely lost it. They, they're beside themselves. They don't know what to do. This is not how they raised their daughter. And so they uh, sent her to reparative therapy, and she did the therapy, and she still wants to live her life as a man. And so they threatened to disown her. She's moving across the country. She doesn't want to be in contact with them. And I look at this story, and I think to myself, right or wrong, I see a parent who's about to lose touch with their kid, and they're going to regret it for the rest of their lives. And a kid who, as they go through some of the most hard stuff that they're going to go through, is going to have not that support network of their parents, knowing that my parents love me and support me no matter what I go through. Why? Because transgender is a core name of this. Uh, tremendous, tremendous costs in our lives if we hold on to these hard spots and have another, we will not see the grace of God move in that area. We will always have this thing, and it's almost like a tumor that grace wants to get rid of, but we just hold on to it, and it stops us from appreciating grace. I used to work at UBC, and um, homeless youth would come in. We had a shelter at the church, and they would come in in the morning, especially when it was wet, and um, I decided it'd be cool if we had kind of coffee set up for them. We could have some coffee, and um, they could get warm, and they could hang out there, and then I could let them into the library, and there was all kinds of music for them to listen to, so I had a little Walkman they could borrow. It was a pretty cool setup. And then I remembered this one um, important lady in the church, uh, or at least she thought she was important, who... Uh, who came up to me and said, you know what, having them here is really scary, and I don't think they're walking here. <laughs> and I thought to myself, she's walking around in fear. She's already lost, and she wants to take away a ministry to these, to these youth um, that grace could move through. When we hold on to a Cornelius, we refuse grace. It's as simple as that. When Christina and I have people over at our house, our house will generally look pretty nice, uh, but it's because we've taken a bunch of stuff and we've jammed it into a closet. <laughs> Anybody else do this? Or the garage, one or the other, depending on how much stuff. Um, but we jam it in there, and um, and we close it away, and we think our house looks good, but it's an illusion. It's not actually clean. Um, in our hearts, we jam. Cornelius is into corners. Uh, we don't like to deal with the fact that we have some. But if we don't, um, it's really, really hard for the grace of God to get in there and to open us up to what it is to be truly alive. Jesus came and said, I have come that you might have life. You might have it abundantly. Um, that abundant life is found in letting Jesus into the closets and into the garage and into the hard spots. I want to uh, share a, a, a picture with you. Um, so a contrast, uh, we, um, Pope Francis, I really, really appreciate the way that he expresses his faith. This is um, one of the traditional Cornelius's as other religions. And um, this is Pope Francis hugging um, two of his friends, one who is an imam, Islam, and um, one who is a rabbi, um, and they're hugging, and they have prayed together, and that's what grace looks like. Right now in our country, um, we 
we have the civil rights movement, but I feel like we're living it again. We have blue lives and uh, black lives matter issues going on. And uh, a problem in our country. And it's, I look for these, when I, when I see these things going on, I constantly wonder, what does it look like when God shows up there? And uh, I'm going to have Christina put up the next picture for us. There were three kids. <coughs> this is a Black Lives Matter protest. These three kids showed up at it with their signs. They say, you matter, smile, you're beautiful, and free hugs. Twelve-year-olds, in their profound wisdom. Um, and then the next picture is what became of that. If you wonder what the kingdom of God looks like in the middle of Blue Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter, this is it. The grace of God, healing, restoration, caught in an image. Tears in his eyes. It's a powerful story, and it's really simple, but it's, it's a tremendous risk for a little boy who's grown up in a society that fears what the police will do to hug this man. And it's a tremendous risk for this police officer who has friends who have been hurt in situations to hug this little boy and say, you are why I'm here. I'll lay down my life for you as well. This is what it looks like when God shows up. In that scripture that I read, um, Peter didn't do much. His sermon's not all that impressive. Uh, and it's even while he's talking, and it's, it's certainly not his argument, but the Holy Spirit comes down upon these people, and he gets to see God do something amazing, something he never expected. Before, if you wanted to become a Christian, you had to be Jewish. And then you could make it follow Christ. And all of a sudden, God took this little tiny sect of Judaism and made it open to the entire world to receive grace. Although that's actually through the entire Bible that it was missed a lot. Um, the grace of God is much bigger than we think it is. And it happens all because Peter says, well, I'm just going to cross this line and be willing to be with these people. He stayed with them for a couple days. He ate their food. He had them in his house. He went into their house. Um, and God showed up. And honestly, if you compare the faith of Cornelius and Peter, uh, Cornelius is actually doing better than Peter. Peter sees this vision three times. And God's like, I'm going to show it to you again. <laughs> All right, one more time. And then it says that Peter was sitting there on the road, still considering, what do you think that might mean? And then when Cornelius shares what happened with him, he says, well, I was praying, and this guy told me to invite you, so I invited you. I invited all my friends, too, so they could hear what you have to say. What do you got? Um, he responded instantly. It's a powerful thing when a couple people are willing to say, I refuse us and them. We all need grace. We're all beggars in need of food, and God offers us grace. We don't have a shred of reason to deserve it. I'm going to, share, I want to close with this story. Uh, Corey Tenbo, I don't know if you know who she is, but she um, was uh, a lady who decided during the Nazi, uh, the rise of the Nazis, to hide Jews. And as a result, um, she was put in a concentration camp. And while in that concentration camp, um, she suffered some horrible things, and her sister did as well. And her sister died while she was, while they were there. And then um, the war ended, the Allied forces came and closed the camp down, and she had survived. And um, she went on a journey with God into the depths of what grace and forgiveness looked like. And so she was... Um, traveling, doing these talks on what it means to have grace, what it means to forgive somebody. And at one particular talk, uh, a soldier came up to her, who she recognized from the camp. He didn't recognize her, but he said, you know, since, since that time I've become a Christian, and I know God's forgiven me, but I think it would mean a lot if you would be able to tell me that I'm forgiven. 
was a hard thing for him to accept. Um, and I'm going to actually share her words of that experience. It's a lie. She has to decide to forgive this person or not. And as I stood there, I who since had again and again been forgiven and could not forgive. My sister had died in that place. Could he erase her death simply by asking me? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, his hand held out to me, but it felt like hours as I wrestled with what I had to do. For I had to do it, I knew that. The message from God forgives us has a prior condition that we forgive those who injure us as well. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, then neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And I knew it, not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality, and those that were able to forgive their former enemies were able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives. And those who refused to forgive, who nursed their bitterness, remained invalids. It was as simple and horrible as that. And as I stood there with coldness clutching my heart, I also remembered that forgiveness is not an action, or is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of your heart. Help, I prayed silently. I can only lift my hand. I can only do that much. You have to supply feeling to me, Lord. And so woodenly and mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one that was outstretched to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. A current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and sprang into our joint hands, and a healing warmth flooded my whole body, and it brought tears to my eyes. And I said, I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. And for a long moment, we grasped each other, the former guard and a former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did in that moment. We want to know how far grace can reach. If we want to know what the love of God looks like in our lives, it's going to be because we allowed it to go further in us. How far will we let grace go towards us and towards others? Or is holding on to our Corneliuses worth not having that? We underestimate incredibly how far God's love goes. So this week, who's your Cornelia? Who's the person that you don't want to spend time to? Who is it that you don't want to extend grace to? Ask for God's help. Take one step in that direction. And as John said, everything we're doing leads up to communion. And we're about um, to do something significant, which is to remember that we have a God who didn't keep his standards who did uh, keep its distance. God had decided, I don't want to get messed up by those messy people. We would be lost. Jesus laid down his life. He came to become one of us who got hurt and wounded because he risked loving us. And as he did so, the grace of God poured forth and we became alive.